What happens if I press the end webinar in the top right? Please Probably don't. Probably webinar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's everyone, a different spot. It's a different spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, we're going to have a great webinar, I can tell. Hi, everybody. This is Charlene O'Hanlon. Welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I am so excited about this conversation we're going to have. We've been having a lot of fun on the back end, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun on the front end as well. Before we get started, we do have some housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of it, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your question and answer tab on your big marker interface here and submit your question. And we will try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you will be one of our four big lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Life Beyond Spinnaker. Our speakers today are Brian Fueling, who is Solutions Architect at Harness, and Eric Arend, who is the DevOps Engineer at MakerBot. Very, very excited to have both of you here. Um, I am really looking forward to this conversation because I think that Eric is going to have some really great insights into how um, MakerBot has successfully integrated Spinnaker. And um, I know the audience is probably going to get a lot, of, a lot of information out of it as well. So thanks to you both for joining me today. I appreciate it. And uh, Brian, I am going to turn things over to you. I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, and let you guys get right to your conversation. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and whatever times are in between those. Um, yeah, so as as was said, I'm a solutions architect at Harness. Um, Eric and I have actually worked a few times together on the, on the Harness MakerBot side of things as well. Um, I've done some stuff with Spinnaker too. Um, always open to a whole bunch of questions that come in. So we're gonna ask, honestly, this is just gonna be a conversation that Eric and I have. It's not like, we're not going to have slideware and presentations and a demo and all this stuff that makes engineers, you know, just giddy. Uh, so mm -hmm. hopefully that's okay. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to ask a, a, some questions to Eric and stuff like that. So feel free to ask questions uh, in the Q and A. Um, and I actually posted one in the chat. So if you want to respond to your, your favorite breakfast cereal, uh, just to kind of break the ice and, and make our E meeting a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, Mine's so. cap and crunch. Hurts the roof Cabin of my crunch. mouth and wakes me up in the morning. Hey, you know, the pain wakes me up. There's nothing like <laughs> scratches on the roof of your mouth that will just get you right out of bed. I'm a huge fan of uh, of fruity pebbles. Ah, so yeah. fruity pebbles are are my go to breakfast cereal. So really enjoy this. Um, but yeah, Eric, great to great to talk to you and, and see you again. It's I feel like it's been a whole 24 hours since I've seen this. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> uh, well, actually, probably just about 24 hours. Looking yeah, at my I think calendar. so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay, so so let's let's start off because MakerBot obviously has been around for uh, quite some time. Quite some time is relative to anybody that is a millennial or younger. So quite some time. Um, oh, Honeygram's Lucky Charms. I like it. Oh, come on, Paul. You you don't eat. Okay, that's fine. Brand is all right. Um, Raisin sorry, brand or like uh, just normal brand. Yeah, or just regular brand. <laughs> Paul, you got to be a little bit more specific. Um, but yeah, so Eric, MakerBot's been around for a while, but you haven't necessarily been there since the beginning of MakerBot. So when did you actually join MakerBot? Um, actually, it is two years tomorrow. Oh, nice. All right. I actually joined Harness two years uh, from like three days ago or something like that. So uh, around the same time. Yeah. That's great. awesome. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you all of your history, but uh, more specifically, since I'm sure we've got a lot of engineers on the call ranging from all types of responsibilities, what, what was probably the most impactful engineering role that you have done, like title, and then what did you actually do? Because we all know titles are really great descriptors of responsibility. So, I've, I, I've had multiple titles they all they've they've all either centered around devops sre but every time i go to a different job they have a different meeting they generally only have one thing in common and that's the cloud i think my first job when i actually worked as a devops engineer it was 
actually more of a skunk works uh, sort of job where we were, you know, proof of concepting things, um, reverse engineering some of the stuff that our R&D department spit out, um, building out uh, SDKs in different libraries for them, um, not really actually doing what I would call DevOps work. Yeah. But that is, um, that actually probably was my most impactful job. And that was okay. maybe three years ago because uh, I left the company uh, that I was working at for about, you know, yeah, about three, four years ago. And they're still using the software I built them. Oh, nice. Well, so that's, that's always a, a good sign. <laughs> well, either, I guess, yeah, we'll say that's a good sign. There could be yeah, a bunch know, of different right? options. We're just going to go with good sign. Um, now, before MakerBot, right? So, so you're obviously you're using Harness now, which is why I'm on the call. It'd be kind of awkward if you weren't using Harness and I was on the call. But uh, you're obviously using Harness now. We know that Spinnaker was what MakerBot was using before that. But before Spinnaker, what what was a what what was the tool solution platform that you were using for integration, deployments, and delivery? Oh, well, it's probably going to be boring to say, but it was Jenkins because it's always Jenkins. It's always, it's always Jenkins. It's literally always. Uh, it's, 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 it's the first go to. If, if, you know, if you know nothing else, you at least know Jenkins or how to write a pipeline in Jenkins. There That's were true. different implementations of Jenkins. I worked at a pretty medium sized company and a relatively large sized company. Um, and, the the smaller company was using Helm with Jenkins to deploy their stuff mm -hmm. to Kubernetes. Another was using their own like built-in solution for Kubernetes deployments. Yeah. Um. So that was uh. I mean, it was still built on top of Jenkins. So you know, all the okay. fun stuff that comes with Jenkins comes with that. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's it's less ideal than yeah. uh something like Spinnaker or Harness. All right. Well, you know what? Actually, that's a that's a good point to start at here because I want to ask the crowd the crowd a question. Uh, let's see. First, Jenkins plugin. That's going to be the question for the crowd. If you guys can, anyone in the audience, what is the when you install a brand new Jenkins platform setup? Not we're not talking about scaling out your Jenkins. Like the first time you install Jenkins, what is the first plugin that you install? I, f I feel like 99% of the time it's some GitHub integration, so you can authenticate with GitHub. Yeah. Or I was thinking um, the uh, the R back one. Oh yeah, oh, something something that allows people to access it without having to maintain, you know, your own database of users. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely okay. Well, what's your favorite Jenkins plugin out of all the Jenkins plugins? And there's that's, I'm not a, that's a hard question time. because yeah. I don't think I have a favorite one. <laughs> yeah. They're I, I all equal in my on, eyes. <laughs> I, I think because it's on Jenkins, I already have a bias against it. Okay. I mean that makes sense. <laughs> you're like you're like the dad, right? Like all the plugins are equal in your eyes. You don't have a favorite plugin. That makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, so so the 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 role that you came before MakerBot. Um, what can you give me a, like a, a rundown of some of the platform outside of just it being Jenkins with like a, a custom thing? Like what were some of the unique pieces, things that you did like, things you didn't like about that platform before you moved to Mo MakerBot? Mm, I, I would say probably the, it was, it was in a, I don't want to give away too many details. I'm sure if, you know, someone looks up my name and, you know, look up my work history, they'll be able to see what company I'm talking about. But yeah. uh, without going too nitty gritty into the details, a lot of the interesting problems that came up with that company was the um, data policy. It had to be entirely on-prem um, or direct connected from AWS. Hmm. And there was a lot of red tape around that. Um, so working with a trying to get, you know, stuff working in the cloud while also dealing with, you know, your on-prem solution. Uh, it's always kind of a, uh, kind of a uh, nightmare to deal with. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so when you left there to move to MakerBot, how far into the Spinnaker adoption was MakerBot when you moved over to the company? Yeah, so... Yeah, so like you said, it, we were all we were already on Spinnaker when okay. I first joined. Um, I think we were moving away from my primary knowledge. We had some Ruby scripts that uh, and CloudFormation that we were using to deploy stuff. We were 
we already had a proof of concept stood up. Um, my first task actually at MakerBot was to um, set up all the pipelines and set up all the workflows, set up all the integrations, all that fun stuff, uh, as well as, um, and this was before Spinnaker Operator or um, Halyard uh, were up. Mm. So we had, uh, we were we were terraforming out all of that. Or it was actually it was Terraform and Ansible that we were using to stand all of that up. So um, it was it was more of a hey, we we tested it out. We can deploy something to it now. Let's just replicate it to make it work and make mm. it so that if we need to spin up a new cluster quickly, we can. Yeah, that makes sense. Repeatable capabilities. Nice. So the the scaling of of Spinnaker, like. Where were you when when um when you first joined MakerBot? How many applications or pipelines would you say that they had versus when you got to like a full like what was the the delta between those two? Um. Well, we have anywhere from I want to say I think we have thirty applications run in our in our web team, which is the primary consumer of these. We have uh, some other from our um, desktop team and some others from our algorithm team. Hmm. But the Delta was we had one pipeline that was stood up as a proof of concept. And then so there was 29 other applications that need to get set up. And each of those applications had like one to four pipelines, one for each mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so we had one for staging, one for uh, prod, one for dev. Um, each one that had steps before, like there was a schema upgrade in the database, we had to uh, factor for that mm -hmm. and then there were also some other integrations like we wanted to have slack alerts when uh something came up we wanted to be able to uh, hook into jira uh, to create tickets for an audit trail for any deployment that happened um as well as we were moving away from docker hub over to gcr uh for, as a container uh registry so that was its own fun uh setup yes <laughs> well, if it's before Halyard, then that means that like Slack notifications and stuff was actually a like a script that was run inside of a pipeline, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, and mm -hmm. those were pretty much um, there were there weren't any like template libraries that we could just hook into. We actually had a GitHub repository that had you know templatized scripts, so you would just have mm -hmm. to go in manually edit them and then paste them into the pipeline and then run it there. Yeah. Um, and generally, I, the way I like to describe myself in the DevOps world is I'm definitely more dev than ops. Mm -hmm. And having to use Control C, Control V uh, always kills me. Yes. <laughs> um, makes me die a little inside. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, my, my fa I think my favorite phrase to kind of dumb down the Control C, Control V was copy pasta. I'm not sure if that yeah. enrages anybody out there, but uh, copy pasta <laughs> was always the way that I, I'd heard it. But, um, yeah, it seems to be a pretty common thing is like, I, I can't tell you how many times I have like my pinky on my command key and it's always just like CV, CV, CV and just like moving between windows. So that totally makes sense. But um, so that would actually also be long enough ago that all of the all of the Spinnaker pipelines would have been in JSON, correct? Uh, yes, um, they were all in JSON. And did they, they did have, have any templating for that? Um, I don't believe they did. We when we we actually were using Armory as our support group okay. um, for it. And their response was to just, you know, copy paste and edit specific fields. Okay. Um, so there wasn't like templatize that we could share across applications or templatize that we could share even across a single application. It was all just copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. So was that like copy, paste the JSON? And then once it generated the, the UI, did you go through and just edit the UI after you copy pasted? <laughs> Uh, you could edit it in the you could edit it in the JSON uh, script yourself. Mm -hmm. um, however, there were problems with that. Um, it's been a while since I worked with uh, Spinnaker, so you'll have to forgive me on this. Um, no, the, no, it's okay. the big um, the big pain point that I noticed was that each that certain fields had UUIDs, and the UUID mm -hmm. was generated by the back end. Mm -hmm. um, so if you didn't have a UUID, you wouldn't see it as an actual. Um, valid json but if you try to create a new uuid you would have to make sure that every that uuid would be referenced in other um aspects of the pipeline yep so it was um it was getting to the point where i was 
building out my own uh, script to kind of templatize that, add some, add another JSON level to it, and just here's the fields that I want to populate. So create another JSON on top of this, mm-hmm. um, which is um, for me, it's kind of redundant. Like it's, for for a solution that is that should be you know using pipelines as code, you should be templatizing all of this stuff without yeah. having to build like helper scripts on top of it. Yeah, I'm sure there's someone out there who's probably like, you should just use JSON it. JSON it's awesome. You could just use JSON it. So I'm sure that question will probably come up later if it hasn't already. But um so by the time that you you had gotten to realizing that you needed something else, what what were some of the final tipping points that were like, hey, we need something to either happen to Spinnaker, either I can build it out another tool something like that but what were the things that got you to the point of realizing like we needed something yeah so the the big two tipping points were the um rbac integrations um i believe it was called fiat um was the their uh rbac integration and it was at a it was counterintuitive um to say the least it was Mm -hmm. very um you we hooked it into github but then you had to assign users to teams, which is, I'm all well and good with that. But if you didn't have very specific granular um, permissions on every single pipeline, or like if you want to have different approver steps, like we have a pipeline that's going to production, we want to have the web team approve it first, then we want to have product approve it because they can see that it's already deployed to staging. But we, so it deployed to staging, you know, the web team does a once over after you know any automated tests run. The prod team or the product team double checks that it's good. Go through all of that, get those approvers. If you mm-hmm. want to make it so that you have those approvers, you have to be extremely granular and very verbose on that. There's yeah. no like um, just this GitHub group can ha- have access to this. Yeah. Um, so th- we were seeing stuff that you know while they weren't um, able to like initially do it. Um, or they they'd have too much or too little access is the short of it. The yeah. other part is we have we have a very large Docker um, uh, registry um, because every commit that a person does to GitHub for a feature branch we store as a Docker container so that our dev- developers can spin up in a dev environment. Um, and across all of our applications, that can create a lot of Docker images. And what wound up happening was. A, por- a developer would push to a, or they'd push a new uh, version tag or a new master br- image. And it would take 48 hours from the container getting pushed to GCR to actually be picked up by Spendaker. Um yeah. In order to actually circumvent that, we had we had two, um, hang on one second, I apologize. Um, And this was Eric is doing his thing. Just a quick reminder: if you've got a question for Eric or Brian, go ahead and use your uh, your web interface there and submit it in the question and answer tab, and we'll get to it during the Q and A period. And I know we've got some Jenkins users out there. So why did nobody comment on that question? What is the first anybody anybody in the audience who's used Jenkins or is using Jenkins? What's the first plugin that you always go and install as soon as you set up a new Jenkins? Like there's there's got to be someone out there who's got an answer for that. But Eric, we're looking up the count of containers inside the container registry, right? Yeah. So it would it would take. 48 hours um, to go from container registry to actually deployed. Um, So we, so there were, my days were split up pretty much into thirds. One third of it was actually editing live manifests on the, um, on the Kubernetes clusters because developers need to, you know, test out the developer stuff in the actual, Mm -hmm. um, in the cloud. Um, But also we had a, um, but also I tried building out my own webhook integration to kind of bypass all of that. Yep. But then also I had to spend the other third of my day um, doing actual stuff that was pertaining to other parts of my job. Yeah. So, so so it was basically coming down to 
I mean, part of it was there was so much troubleshooting work that you had to do to make it work to meet the demand that you were getting from everybody else. And so basically what you guys were doing, not by no fault of your own, is becoming kind of a bottleneck at that point. But sweet, I'm getting a lot of gits, a lot of git, uh, one docker, job configuration history, roles. Yeah, Henry, roles is probably the first one that I usually go and, uh, and get the plugin for out of all of those. So that definitely makes sense. But yeah, um, so Eric, when we're talking about the Spinnaker side of things, um, what were some of the things that you were doing outside of a webhook that you were trying to build maybe on the side or or add to the code itself to try to mitigate some of these issues that you guys were seeing? Um, so yeah, so one of the first things we did was move into Halyard, um, then Spinnaker Operator, uh, then leveraging dinghy files. Um, just to get us to a place where we wanted to like have, you know, pipelines as code. Okay. Um, and did you look at any of like the open source stuff that's out there on GitHub, like anything the snap team put out or anything like that? I did look at the original Spinnaker, um, for, for the issues that I was having specifically like that 48 hour one, I was looking yeah. at, you know, um, I, I did take a look at some, uh, GitHub issues and mm -hmm. seeing what I could do there, but at the end of the day, you know, for just to kind of like put this more into perspective, MakerBot DevOps team is extremely small. Um, it's actually just me right now. Um, and when we had Spinnaker, it was uh, two people. Nice. Um, so uh, we didn't actually, um, it, it, it got to the point where my boss and I were talking and we're like, look, this isn't, something that we should be spending a lot of time on you know yeah this is we have other pressing matters because you know as you'll find out like a lot of company companies are either small enough where they can start out in the cloud and be okay or they're big enough where they can just throw money at the cloud and be okay but when you have a medium-sized company that's transitioning from you know either a data center to the cloud or one cloud to another or trying to have a higher presence in the cloud mm -hmm. um that's where a, a lot of work needs to be done, um, especially gotcha. a company like MakerBot that hasn't historically had a huge web presence. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been mostly a hardware, firmware, and desktop developer uh, system, and we've been moving more towards cloud development. So our, our time was better focused on making sure that um, not just you know, deployments are good, but you know, application design is good, that you're building in a way that, you know, that works with 12 factor, um, stuff like that. So that, that's one of the, um, more pressing issues that we had to take. So we're like, we, st my boss and I started looking at managed solutions. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, at, at some point, the needs of MakerBot as a company, the needs of the developers, as you're onboarding new developers, new function, new feature, things along those lines, new applications, those needs almost take a backseat to ensuring stability and current capabilities. So were you getting a pretty significant technical debt mountain as you were needing to spend more time dedicated to the Spinnaker side? Significant is kind of a uh, understatement, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was there was a lot of uh, technical debt that we had to look at just from the infrastructure side of things, but also um, from the web from the uh, website of things as well. Um, mm -hmm. Our web team. Um, it, it's gotten better um over time our web team is actually probably in the best state it's been in for a while mm -hmm. but the um the initial team the initial people that i was working with it was they, they've only worked at makerbot so it's one of those situations where like you know they know how to write the code but they just need some guidance and how to like not do it locally and you know get it out there in a the cloud how to do all that other stuff so there was there was mm -hmm. tech debt mounting on all um at every corner um the more mm -hmm. time we spent on spinnaker yeah and then that came that probably became significantly worse when you went from two devops people to one <laughs> devops person yeah i mean that was that was when we actually started we started looking at harness before we went from two to one um mm -hmm. and then when we went from two to one i i went to my boss and said i cannot i cannot do all of my stuff 
um, and work on Spinnaker. So we're going to need to move to a better solution. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's a, probably a good point to just to kind of to sit on for a second, because as you mentioned before, there are small enough teams or small enough companies where they can just kind of start in the cloud. And then mm-hmm. you have big enough teams or big enough companies that can just throw money at the cloud and kind of like solve the problem with more people or more managed service providers or things along those lines. But you have this medium company that's moving. It's it's actually the same with honestly any solution. It's not Spinnaker specifically, but depending on the solution that's out there, some of them are easier to scale and some of them are not depending on the needs of the company and the engineers and what you're trying to support. It's kind of difficult to scale in general. And so your solutions are, do you add a workaround? Do you add a new solution or do you add more people, right? And in a lot of cases, it'd be great to add more people, but you know, it, from, from your perspective, do you think that adding another five people would have helped you resolve the Spinnaker issues or would those have been more around resolving technical debt while one person like yourself was dedicated to the Spinnaker side? Um, it, it definitely would have been the latter where one person looks at this, the other five actually do, you know, work that clears up our tech debt. Gotcha. Um, but again, you know, between, and this was all pre COVID, you know, once COVID yeah. hit and we started and company started to, um, feel the squeeze a bit more. It was, uh, it, it was hiring people, more people became less and less of a, uh, a possibility. <laughs> Yes. And I'm sure that everybody on this call can understand that one. I mean, even like for us, like there was a time where it was like, Hey, we have all this open head count. And then it was like, Nope, stop everyone. Stop hiring everybody. Some people going on furlough type things. Cause you just, you don't know what the market's going to do. You don't know where it's going to go. And yeah, I mean, we, we lucked out a bit. Uh, I don't think we were hit as hard as a lot of other companies. Um, we have, we have two, um, verticals that we kind of work out of, which is like the prosumer market, which is the um, professional um, people looking to do rapid prototyping. But then we mm-hmm. also have the education market, and the education market is where we kind of hit more because if kids aren't, if people aren't in school, then you know they're yeah. not going to be using their printers at school. And if they're not using their printers at school, why bother getting a printer? Yeah, it makes sense. Did you find that the like the hobbyist market at kind of scaled up at all? I don't think we actually, um, I don't think the hobbyist market is really a vertical for us because our, our yeah. printer, we, we have lower end printers that are much more hobbyist aligned, but they're kind of been falling out of, um, out of, uh, out of favor for our more industrial size printers. Mm. Um, like, uh, you'll see that, and this is again, uh, MakerBot has more history than I have with them. Um, but we were actually brought out by a parent company, Stratasys. Uh, initially, it was a startup that was building uh, wooden 3D printers that people would assemble themselves. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. We have we have those st- in the office still as demos. Hmm. Um, and we used to have a mini desktop that was like about this big or something that you could print mm-hmm. tiny little figurines on, but nothing like you know for hobbyists. Our yeah. our stuff is like. Um, I, I think we're actually um, debuting a extruder that handles metal now, Ooh. rather than just uh, plastic based stuff. But um, okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend I'm an, an expert on 3D printing. Yeah. I, I, I know web <laughs> development, infrastructure, and all that other stuff. I let the uh, people who are uh, way better at all that other math stuff uh, handle that. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually. That's another good question for the uh, for the audience. What's your new pandemic hobby? Based off of the bakery shelves and Target, <laughs> everyone became a baker because you can't find yeast or flour anywhere, um, at uh, least for the first like three months. So yeah, so if anyone came up with a new pandemic hobby, sewing, playing a new instrument, whittling wood, maybe you got into 3D printing, um, post that one in the chat. That'd be interesting to see too. Uh, day drinking is not a hobby though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please don't put that in there. That is not a... <laughs> <laughs> that is not a hobby at all. Uh, no, our our my wife and I our hobby was um, going and looking at houses because that was that was really cool. So we just kind of walked around and did, oh, did yeah, houses no. for a while. That was pretty great. Uh, my so. wife and I actually picked up World of Warcraft and we play that together. Uh, nice. It's actually kind of funny that I say that because after we moved to Harness, we actually I could actually have some off time to spend with my family. So yeah, uh, uh, that was uh, that was uh, something we actually got to do for once. 
That's actually probably a good segue to get into the harness side of things. So inevitably someone out there is going to be like, well, I know Eric where you're coming from. Like I, I sympathize with you. You were dealing with these things, these tools, things like that. But why didn't you look at tool a plus tool B plus tool C plus this other giant stack of tools, plus a bunch of CRDs plus a bunch of operators. Why didn't you just look at that, Eric? So I'm going to kind of head off all of those questions into one. What was it that made you want to just move over to something like harness without going through an extensive POC of like 20 different solutions, both managed and open source. All right. Let me just answer Lewis's question. Uh, first, uh, Yes, it was classic, but also Battle for Azeroth at the same time. Um, so we were doing that. Um, I My wife is relatively new with video gaming, and I wanted her to feel the pain of classic. Um, <laughs> so so that's, now that I got that out of the way, to answer your question, it's a matter of time and headcount. I, okay. uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I couldn't... Um, like I said, we had so many other projects working on. We were in the process of moving out of AWS and into GCP. Mm -hmm. um, part of that was just our initial thing was just stand up a GCP instance, get everything over, and then worry about terraforming it later. So that was one thing. Um, there were multiple new services from the uh, web and print teams that wanted to have their um, uh, their desktop application available on the cloud, which now it is. You can check it out at cloudprint.com or cloudprint.acrebot.com. Uh, small plug there um yeah. and also the other just generic um work that we had to do and just day-to-day -day troubleshooting with the applications um i don't know if uh there's many 3d printer uh enthusiasts in the uh chat but makerbot also runs and owns thingiverse.com which is the largest 3d um modeling website in and slash community in the world and we were in the process of um you know updating it because you know little little trade secret um it was a very old application that was running on i want to say php 5 6 when i first mm -hmm. got here um so there were a lot of um there were a lot of things that we needed to handle yeah. um on that end and as well as just moving over from a to that massive application and yeah. the massive database and all that other wonderful stuff over from AWS to GCP. That's uh that's its own can of worms. Um, and we were, and I'm sure if anyone was on Thingiverse in um, the winter of 2019, um, it was down a lot. So I, I didn't even have the time or the energy to like, at that time, Spinnaker was just such a, backseat uh thing for me where i was like look if we if we need to deploy just call me text me on my phone and i'll update the ml file on gke so okay. that it works so that you guys don't have to like sit and wait 48 hours for a commit to go through so it was a combination of lack of lack of people lack of time a growing technical st like mountain technical debt mountain plus you had current processes and tooling that really needed to be supported and brought out. And then you were also hit with a pandemic as well. This is just before the pandemic, but yeah, it's a, it's a perfect storm. Um, yeah. Who was in that movie anyway? I don't even remember. That was so, old, so long ago. I know. Long, I I'm, like a, I'm a millennial. Famous. So long ago is anything longer than a, than a week. Yeah. Um, I thought it was still 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, um, but no, I mean, that's, well, it's interesting because you bring up Perfect Storm. Honestly, I think that the vast majority of companies that I've talked to are in that situation because of the pandemic. Almost everybody has gone to online presence, trying to take over market share, and it's a big drive to we need to get we need to get a good functioning product that can scale with our users, that can meet demand, and that is better than our competitors, or else we're just going to die, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a that's a a big thing. So I think honestly, what um, what, what MakerBot was dealing with just prior to the pandemic, the whole, you know, Spinnaker side of things, the, ba the backlog, the technical debt stuff, the desire for your business, your, I mean, I'm assuming the business mandate was more of making things better, moving it over to GCP, getting things a lot easier set up over there. Oh yeah. That was, that was part of it. Um, it was also just stability in general. Um, yeah. just, you know, again, like I, I, I don't say this in I, I say this with the 
utmost respect to the previous developers we've had. Um, but you know, this was a this was their first job, yeah. uh, and you know, usually at a first job you have some sort of leadership uh, that has had experience. You know, so you know how to make an express app, but do you know how to make an express app scalable? Um, do you know the proper ways to you know containerize it to break it into yep. smaller microservices? Do you know how to do all that other stuff? And that's the kind of leadership that we didn't have uh, prior to uh, my involvement, as well as uh, we recently just. Uh, I think maybe I want to say a year after I got hired, we actually hired a um, a senior web dev to kind of lead that position. Nice. So there was there was all that technical debt as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 uh, no hating to the free code camp graduates out there. I myself am a free code camp. Yeah, graduate, I, so well done. yeah, I learned, uh, I learned development work on the job, uh, when yeah. I was, because my first job was just help desk and, you know, being a hundred percent transparent here, I was working midnight, I was working night shifts and I was spending time studying and watching Simpsons reruns and yep. I, uh, I learned to code so I could quickly fix people's problems without getting interrupted and, yeah. Luckily, my boss was smart enough to just, or saw the potential in that, and just moved me over to working more automation and more software development. Yep, I've, I've so. definitely seen that one myself as well. Well, the move over to Harness then. So, so we got that move, or, or it was Harness was introduced in some way, shape, or form to MakerBot. What was your perspective when you saw Harness and when you started playing with it first? Um, yeah. So it was presented to me as a um, Spinnaker alternative. Um, I looked at it, I saw the fact that it could handle our massive container registry, the fact that there was granular RBAC, uh, and there was a lot of the integrations that we were planning to build out, um, built into it, like Jira integrations are, the Jira integration hook is there. The major other win for me was bi-directional sync uh, with Git, because we had our dinghy files on Spinnaker. So if you updated your UI, or if you updated Spinnaker on your UI, it wouldn't reflect back to the dinghy file. So you had to update the dinghy file. But if you mm -hmm. updated the dinghy file, it would update the UI. So it was that one th directional thing, which is which is great, or it's not terrible, but it's not ideal, but it's usable, especially if you know the dinghy file inside and out, especially for the type of pipeline that you're working with. Mm -hmm. But once you start like building out more complex pipelines or touching things that you're, you're not 100% aware of, that's when you want to start using the UI to kind of learn how you want to templatize those things. And that's where like, I'm, I'm saying, okay, well we have, and that's where bi-directional uh, synchronization works really, really well um, yeah. on, uh, on harness because I just, you know, I, one of the things we're doing is we're adding more integrations, we're adding the continuous verification hooks, uh, syncing with Datadog, syncing with stack driver, um, running our own uh, live smoke tests in as part of the pipeline. And for proof of concepting that, I don't want to have to write a YAML file from scratch. I just yeah. want to proof of concept it with one application and then on, on the UI and then have it create that uh, pipeline as code for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point because I've talked to I've talked to quite a few people around... Um, wanting to do things programmatically, which I think is really funny, by the way, because almost everything was actually, everything was programmatic when, when computers first came out. And then you saw this explosion of usage once the UI started coming together. You could like click on pictures and like double click on pictures. And then now there's so much convolution in, I don't even know if that's the right word, convolution, convolution. Sure, we'll go with it. Um, um, but there's so much associated to that, to the UI. There's like layers of clicking that you have to go through that now we're kind of going back to the, I just want to automate it. I just want to use a, an API. I just want to use a, a configuration file like a YAML. And that's great. But, you know, Eric, to your point, YAML is a structure of a file that you can use a syntax on. But one YAML file for one thing doesn't mean that it works with the same thing on the other side. Like you can't apply a harness YAML file to a Kubernetes cluster and just say yeah. like, hey, Kubernetes run this, you know, and same thing with ECS. And like you can't, but you can't do it with JSON. You can't do it with anything else. So it's important to have that structure, but it's important to also know that like, don't ever expect to walk into any tool and just know right away because you've done YAML in one place that you know all of the syntax for the YAML in another one. Yeah, I, I I think the idea of calling it a markup language is a lot more um, 
or configuration language. It, it's a syntax that tells you how to, what like data structures there are and yeah. provide some, you know, semblance to human readability and machine readability as well. But once you, if you don't know the syntax off the top of your head, and you know, this is one of the things I've actually been pushing for a lot in our APIs um, mm -hmm. for our web team is to just like start using uh, Swagger APIs on all their stuff so that, you know, if someone wants to develop for, against our applications, all that documentation and all those things are there. But if they're not, then, you know, yeah. E Reverse engineering is a really easy way to do it, but you know, like I said, Harness kind of does that for us by yeah. um, by us building out the initial thing, and then we just click a couple buttons to templatize it, and then share mm -hmm. it with the rest of the applications and call it a day. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm a. I like GraphQL API simply because I do have a, a DBA background, so I do like the fact that I can just do this massive query and pull back only that which I'm curious about finding out i don't have to run like 17 rest api queries and try to like pass one value to the other but at the same time graphql has not matured enough yet to to win over my developer heart yeah i, I i've recently just started dabbling in it and some of our other devs are doing that because we have um especially our printer proxy um if you want to look up your uh the printer status it returns a massive object so yeah. being able to put that behind a GraphQL thing would be nice, but you know you also need to really document the hell out of that GraphQL thing because it, that's one of the my pain points in using GraphQL. So especially if I'm trying to develop against GitHub, I I need to know their uh, their schema and how to do that. But yeah. luckily, client libraries kind of extract all abstract all of that for us. So yes. it's, yeah. it's a nice uh, yeah. Well, let's actually, I'm going to, that's going to be the next question. I didn't get a whole lot. I mean, Paul with the jigsaw puzzles, Paul jigsaw puzzles are awesome. I love playing jigsaw puzzles are really good. And Kathy is cooking new vegetarian recipes for virtual, Ooh, tours, virtual tours. I didn't even think about that. That's a good one. I may actually have to do that. Yeah. I got to check that one out. I haven't even thought about that. Um, but yeah, so question for everybody in the audience, GraphQL or REST API, which one are, which one are you all liking, you know, let me know. Let me know which one you prefer. Which one you use. Um, we don't need to get into a GraphQL REST API war, but if you like one or the other, <laughs> uh, that is pretty good. Um, so let's go into the harness side of things. So POC is done, right? And obviously, MakerBot's using harness now. What What was your experience bringing things over from Spinnaker into harness? What was that experience like? I think we managed to do it all in a week or not even a week, like I think it took three days to import all of our pipelines over. It was mm -hmm. extremely uh, simple to do. Like we we just, um, remember RMI? <laughs> <laughs> Ravi with the uh, Java objects, I like it. Oh God. Um, <laughs> oh no, I, 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 I try and stay away from Java. I, I, I very much, the DevOps guy who always talks about Golang. Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, but no, um, moving over to Harness was simple. We we got one pipeline that we wanted to do. Um, and then we just were like, okay, cool. We have it. It's templatized, share it across the applications. And it took, we did it in, you know, obviously, in, you know, logical environments. We had all of our production deployments going through Spinnaker or, you know, me, updating the manual YAMLs. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, but we were still deploying everything uh, on staging and any development environments through um, Harness. Okay. And we were seeing things just go way quicker with Harness. Mm. Um, also, we added a lot more gates to our production deployment, specifically in the uh, in the approver section. Um, and you know, I, I think it only takes me like, I, I know I have a backlog of tickets of things I want to integrate more in harness, but those only take maybe two to three days to like get from a proof of concept to actually pushed out across all of our applications. Yeah. Like yeah, I it's, think a, it's important to note for everybody. There's not a magical button click where you just like, here's harness and you like point it to Spinnaker and you just say like convert and it just magically does all of it for you. This is literally like Eric and team had to architect harness 
and then bring things over one by one from the spinnaker side. So that process only took like two to three days and it wasn't two to three full days. It was like, Oh, what was it like a couple hours a day or something like that we were working yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, I I pretty much just, you know, sectioned off a bit of time where I said, you know, bother me if something's burning. Um, yeah. I, I'm making, I'm fixing our deployment process. Okay. And, um, and what's been your outcome of that? Like time back, technical debt mountain reduction, anything along those lines? Oh, well, the great thing is I can actually spend time with my family now. Um, I actually, I, like I said, I, I, I don't know if I said this during the uh, webinar, but I was sectioning off my day where a third of the first part of my day was helping developers deploy. The other part was Spinnaker. And then like from six to 10 was actual work that I was, that I needed to do anyway. Mm. So that that's one great thing. Um, the other part is I really just, it's not even like a real concern for me anymore. Um, mm. I, I don't spend a lot of my time on deployment processes. Um, if I, I think the only real time I spend on deployment processes is if a pipeline fails and the developer goes, I don't know why this failed. I have to, you know, walk them through the troubleshooting steps and be like, okay, here you go. Here's, here's where you can see the logs. Here's the output. Here's the output from Kubernetes. Here's why the deployment failed. Um, uh, check all of that other stuff. Yeah. So once you got now, now you didn't move a hundred percent of everything from Spinnaker into Harness because there was some stuff that you just didn't need to move over at all. But what were the total amount of applications you moved from Spinnaker to Harness? Do you remember? Well, let me get that for you. I actually have my Harness config up right here. Uh, uh, applications. Let's see, one, two, three. There should be a four, number at the five, top. Six. Oh, it, I, I'm actually just looking at a uh, Visual oh. Studio. Oh, okay, um, gotcha. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. So twenty-four applications, and each of those has anywhere between one to four specific microservices. In it. Okay. Um, like uh, one of our applications is like one logical group of applications, but it's broken into three separate smaller applications. So mm -hmm. that I, I would actually probably estimate anywhere from like 35 applications we brought over. Okay. And then, so in Spinnaker, a pipeline is typically one pipeline per environment per microservice or artifact. And then you can have like an optional like pipeline triggers pipeline, or you can have like a parent pipeline, which which links the different pipelines together. Did you guys go with the parent pipeline perspective or did you go with like when pipeline dev succeeds auto trigger pipeline QA? Um, we, we had it, we had it set up so that there were all different pipelines and they weren't triggering from each other. Um, okay. So we, when a, when a develop when a staging image got pushed, uh, the static environment trigger, then the developers would have to push to a master image, mm -hmm. and then that would get pushed to the, the master, uh, the prod environment. We've actually, we're looking into doing a promotional pipeline where it promote, goes from staging, it's one single pipeline, or we were looking into um, pipeline triggers pipeline for Spinnaker mm -hmm. um, as part of like the promotional pipeline thing, but we decided... Um, against it because we were just already moving into harness so yeah um that's and harness was easy enough where you know the the thing i liked about it was they had pipelines and workflows where like pipelines are just strung uh, up different workflows next to each other so you can have as many workflows as you want and pipelines are just the logical order that they go into yeah. so it was really easy to create a promotional pipeline and uh get the developers on board Okay. Um, so you had, I think, 30 something applications in Spinnaker when we were first talking, and there was at least four pipelines per application. So we were looking at like a hundred and something pipelines total, I think is something like 100. that. We were able and to then consolidate in, a lot of that in Harness, though. Yeah, because we, now we're at 24 
applications in harness we did a one-to-one mm -hmm. -one mapping there but for workflows and pipelines it's what like one pipeline and maybe two workflows we've actually updated app. we've actually created a lot more workflows per app um because we decided to be a little bit more granular in our okay. uh, thing so why don't we have a deployment pipeline where you can just deploy your image raw um like straight straight directly to the thing but then we mm -hmm. also have pipelines for approvers um we have pipelines for um we have pipelines where we integrate with jira we have pipeline we or we have workflows that are specific to integration testing for mm -hmm. um database updates um you know if there's a specific redis key that needs to be cleared before deployment or after deployment we have a pipe we have a workflow for that so okay we have a lot of workflows for all of our applications mm. but the actual pipelines themselves we have we have like one pipeline per application okay so just for nomenclature for everyone typically speaking in jenkins and hopefully i get all this right you have upstream and downstream builds you can use like a plugin uh, the pipeline plugin or blue ocean if you want to and those like string builds together and you can see how the upstream downstream is working in spinnaker every everything you do inside of spinnaker is actually a pipeline like it's the thing that links the artifacts the manifests the execution processes all that type of stuff together is a pipeline and then you can link multiple pipelines together to make a pipeline of pipelines so those are the difference there in harness you have what's called a workflow which is your definition of your deployment so all your pre-deployment deployment and post-deployment steps those go in a workflow and a pipeline is basically stringing workflows together so you and you know eric has talked about some of the templating capabilities you really don't have to have that many it, it's up to what the team wants and, and eric's team wants to do more granular capabilities in a workflow but you could have one workflow that you reuse three times in the pipeline and you can use the same service to move it across three different environments one workflow, one pipeline. Yeah. So there's a lot of interactivity. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, we have our deployment workflows, which actually deploy the stuff to the cluster. And we use that yep. three to uh, like two to three times per pipeline. Yeah. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Where's, I'm going to hit these real quick because these yeah, are good sure. ones. So Hamanth asked, is Harness available um, SaaS and AWS Azure GCP? Yes, it is available um, in all the clouds. Uh, and then Josh asked, is harness the primary tool tool for developers or for DevOps sysadmins? I'm assuming he's directing that one towards, towards you, Eric. Um, I, I would say it's, like I said, I, I always view DevOps, um, that title as like a nebulous nothing. Um, it could mean a lot of different things. Um, but for, for me, it's, it's a tool for the developers because it allows them to deploy their, um, their applications into the cloud or into an environment without any, you know, any manual process or whatever manual gates they want to have. But it's also a tool for, you know, DevOps because we we allow we can granularly control what gets deployed where. Um, and we use it to kind of orchestrate where our applications go, what environments we point to. Um, it's a very blurry line. I I I would and I'm not even dipping into the other stuff like um, Cost Explorer, which uh, we recently got built into Harness, and that even like leverage it. We even have our product people looking at that hmm. um, as well. So it's 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 pri I would say it's primarily for developers to get their stuff built into the cloud, but it's also for DevOps, so they don't need to because historically, like the de deployment process is a DevOps, you know under that wheelhouse mm -hmm. um but it, yeah. it it takes away you know the burden of maintaining and owning that for a uh, devops team yeah um actually to kind of circle back to a, a question i asked before about like what were some of the the returns on investment for you um so you talked about the being able to actually spend time with your family and not having to have <laughs> the third of the time that you were spending before um so, so I guess two two follow ups on that one. The first one is, what is your what is your daily or weekly interactivity with Harness right now? If you were to give it a time range, and then the second one is, what are you doing? If you have more time, what are you doing with all that free time now at work? Okay, so the first one's a easier question to answer. Um, 
the time that I'm actually spending with Harness is usually troubleshooting a deployment. Like if a pod goes into a crash loop back off state and they don't know what's going on or why it didn't, or, or like we have a new developer that we're onboarding. Um, there is always, it's just generally like general knowledge transfer and being like, okay, mm -hmm. here's, here's why your deployment failed. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't actually harness. It was your pod that broke or your configuration that broke it. Mm -hmm. um, and here's how you can troubleshoot that. Uh, as well as looking into other things I can build into Harness. Um, so that that's the, I would say, like maybe four to five hours a week tops. Okay. Um, and that that's on a bad week. Okay. Um, uh, as for what I'm actually doing, um, I'm actually doing my job now, but um, <laughs> I, I have a... I have a lot of other stuff that I can that I need to work on. Like one of our big things mm -hmm. was, you know, terraforming our environment, uh, reviewing security practices, making sure that you know we're not over provisioning stuff, uh, figuring out where we can cut costs, mm -hmm. and uh, again, that kind of circles back to Cost Explorer, where we're figuring out how to optimize our um, our limits, requests, uh, VM size, all that other fun junk, okay. um, as well as just you know normal infrastructure stuff like you know one of the issues we ran into with gcp was uh there's no um load balancing um something there's no like auto scaling load balancing uh mm. db like aurora was so we have to build out our own you know utility for that and we've already built that we're just extending it and mm. being able to actually spend time on developing all those different parts for it um is great because yeah you know I, I've had the time now where I can, you know, build this piece of build this tool that integrates with our infrastructure, but also build out Terraform providers for it um, and, and stuff that I just, you know, wouldn't have the time to work on. I mean, also, it gives yeah. me some time to, to test the waters in new stuff that I'm not really knowledgeable about. Like, I, I have time now where I can, you know, say, well, I uh, I got done with a decent chunk of my work for the week. Let me and I'm still blocked on a couple of the other tickets. Let me try and learn React, or let me try and learn GraphQL. Mm. Um, let me let me try let me demo this utility from GCP. Like it, it just gives me the time to actually, you know, either try new things or re revitalize our old processes. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Awesome. Well, Charlene, I'll hand it back over to you. Eric, really, really appreciate the the insight into everything that you guys went through and and what you're going through right now. So, yeah, um, what a great conversation. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, Thank especially you. like the uh, the you know the breakfast cereal question that was that was a great <laughs> way to break the ice. I I love that. So. <laughs> Good on you, Brian. Okay, guys, um, I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. There were some really great questions that did come in, and I think we got to all of them. But if we didn't, please know that the folks at Harness are getting a copy of all of the questions that came through, and I am sure that they will be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. Also, a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Okay, I did mention at the top of the hour that we would be doing a uh, drawing for four twenty-five dollars Amazon gift cards. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and do that. Our first winner today is, drum roll please, Francesco M. Congratulations, Francesco. Our second winner today is Paul P. Congratulations, Paul. Our third winner today is... Riley R. Congratulations, Riley. And our fourth and final winner today is Irene O. Congratulations, Irene. We'll be following up with uh, all four of you by email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. If you don't see um, anything in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Eric, I'm really sorry that you did not win the Amazon <laughs> gift card. Same with you, Brian. <laughs> but you're not uh, you're not able to. So sorry about that. <clears throat> I take donations so. <laughs> if anyone wants to uh, send me an email. We'll, we'll set up a GoFundMe. <laughs> I got I got a Patreon <laughs> that you guys can donate to. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, guys. Well, I do want to thank uh, Brian and Eric for a great presentation. Uh, lots, lots of great information and just a, a fun conversation all the way around. So thanks. Thanks guys. Really do appreciate your insight there. Yeah. All right, thanks cool. everyone. Yeah. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. And please stay safe. All right. Have a good one.